at KXV 900 uh, 230, but they've also got an FM broadcast now. They simul, they simul broadcast on FM. Anybody know the FM call letters? Number? One what? 100.7 FM. Okay, and it's on the web too. Yeah, so that's good. Uh, a lot of times you're in an area where you can't get the uh, AM signal, but you can get it on the internet. All right. Amen. Pray for them. That's good. I'm going to get the word out. Turn to Psalm chapter number 51 with me tonight, please. The 51st Psalm. Verse 1. Title of message tonight, How to Get Right with God. How to Get Right with God. Psalm 51, verse 1. David said, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Father, I pray that you bless this holy word now as it goes forth. For those that hear it, it's the living word, Father. The living word of God will produce life in those that hear it and receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. The Ethiopian eunuch was reading from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. And God sent Philip, the evangelist from, from uh, Samaria, where they were having a great move of the Spirit of God. He caught him up and sent him down to Gaza, and that's where the Ethiopian eunuch was located. That's where he was. He was headed back to Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, been to worship, reading Isaiah chapter 53, but didn't understand what he was reading. He said, Philip asked him, said, Understandest thou what thou readest? He said, How can I accept some man guide me or teach me, instruct me in the way? You'll find in the Bible over and over again how one instructs another in the Word of God. The Lord Jesus instructed them from the Scriptures Beginning with Moses and the prophets, he taught them all the things pertaining to himself. And the Bible says, they said, did not our hearts burn, desire, burn within us when he opened to us the scriptures. So the Bible is a book that must be interpreted by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And when the Holy Ghost comes, he said in John 16, he will guide us into all truth. So we, do, we live in a spirit world, in a spirit realm that is absolutely controlled by the spirit of the living God. As I preached to you this morning, you must be born again. This is one of the absolute necessities of the new birth, and that is that once you are born again, you have then been given the great blessing and privilege of the interpretation and understanding of the Bible. This is why the Bible says that you have an unction from the Father, an unction from the Holy One, and this unction is that you can understand the Scriptures. Now there's a position of teaching given to the to faithful men of God who shall be able to teach others also. This is where God raises up and gives further understanding, deeper knowledge and deeper understanding in the Word of God so that they might open it up and teach others. And that's a wonderful calling to be able to teach. But as far as picking up the Bible and receiving something from God and having God speak to you, if you're a born-again believer, that's your heritage. That's your right. That's who you are. You should be able to open the Bible and let God speak to you. In the 51st Psalm, I titled the message tonight, How to Get Right with God. You'd be amazed at what religion will put you through to get you right with God. You'd be amazed at the things that men have created, manufactured, fabricated to, to put between you and God before you can be right with God. And all of these things that men have created, fabricated, and so forth and so on have been done so that men can control you. It all boils, boils down to the simple fact that men want to control you. And if anyone ever made a man free, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible is written not to, him, not to put you in bondage, not to enslave you, but to make you free. So in the Old Testament text, when David cried unto God, Psalm chapter number 51, he gave us the basic fundamental things involved in getting right with God. The first thing that he said is, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. 
Loving kindness in the Old Testament is grace. That's another word for grace. According to your grace. In plain words, David was appealing to the character of God, knowing that God is a gracious God. Gracious. He, 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 he delights in ministering grace to a believer or anyone else who desires grace. And so he says, have mercy upon me. If you'll notice, when he starts this out, he doesn't lay the blame at anyone's feet but his own. You understand that when Nathan, uh, when Nathan uh, approached him and confronted him about his sin with Bathsheba and the ultimate murder of Uriah the Hittite, that Na David did not turn around as Adam did and say, the woman you gave me, Lord, the woman you gave me, shifting the blame, trying to put the responsibility off to something else. It may work like this in your life. You may hear the word of God, a preacher ministers to you, and, and Satan comes along and says, now you need to understand that you're not as accountable as other people because of the life, you were, you, the way you were raised, what you were denied as a child, all of the shortcomings you had in your family. Well, let me say something to you tonight. Now, everybody doesn't come up the same way. And when God saves someone, he saves them all the same way by grace through faith and the blood covenant. Amen. I wasn't raised very good, folks. I did not come up in a, an exemplary home. I did not have a mother and a father. As a matter of fact, I had a lot of things stacked against me from day one, but God still loved me, saved me, and I cannot use that as an excuse for living a rebellious life today saying I didn't get the breaks that you got. You see, this is what happens. Satan can lay every kind of an excuse in the world at your door, and you can lay claim to it as a, as a way of getting out of, of, of being responsible. Belzebub's attacking me tonight. Y'all pray for me. He's up here working me over. I thought it was just Hillary and, and, and Obama had the fly light on my I don't know what's going on. <laughs> Something up here buzzing around. You can't. You cannot skirt your responsibility, and if you try to and make excuses, you'll never advance with God. You have to start at square one. Have mercy on me, O oh God, for what I've done. I did it. Maybe someone else was, was in collusion with me. Maybe there's some other parties involved in it, okay. But I did my part, and I'm responsible for what I did. Accept responsibility. Step one, accept responsibility. Step one. The second thing he said is in verse number three, Psalm 51. He said, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Acknowledge your sin. In plain words, he didn't say, I acknowledge my weaknesses. I acknowledge my shortcomings. He called it what it is. I acknowledge my transgressions. You understand that that little three-letter word is the biggest problem in humanity? One of the shortest words you could ever have is, is the biggest problem in humanity with, with a man's relationship with God, sin. Now, a separate message entirely is what, is what Christ, how Christ relates to sin and what he came into this world to do with sin and what God has done with sin because of Christ and all the power and authority you have over it now and all of that. But the point tonight is simply this. Acknowledge it for what it is. It is sin, sin, sin. Now, you've got a bunch of people today that have been so brainwashed that they think they are so high and mighty, so pious. I marvel at what's been coming out in the political race here, how some of these accusations have been brought against people. And some of these, some of these, uh, some of these, uh, uh, what, do you, what do you want to call it? Some of these emotions and all have been so greatly offended by what so-and-so has done? Are you kidding me? Are you serious? This is, not to, this is not to condone anything that anybody does. But if a generation ever lived that is jaded, it's this generation. Yes, sir. And this is not speaking to you individually tonight. Maybe you have. And there are people, no doubt there are people in this country who truly do have a sincere, genuine, sweet uh, heart and soul. That is, that, is, that is living for the Lord and that can be offended with the stuff that most of the people don't even give a second thought to. No doubt, no doubt. I don't doubt that at all. But in this political arena that you're watching, you're hearing all this stuff, that's the biggest joke I ever heard of in my life. Listen, acknowledge your sin. I have sinned. 
I have sinned. And notice the second thing, the third thing about it is this. In verse number four, against thee only, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Now that's quite a remarkable thing because it was Uriah that died. It was Bathsheba that David had committed adultery with. And eventually a child would wind up dying as a direct result of what had happened. The sin had to be put on someone. And so the, result, the resulting judgment of that sin was placed on the child. That doesn't happen to happen today because Christ is the one that the judgment of sin was placed upon. So that baby in the Old Testament that died becomes a type of Christ because the sin of judgment was put upon it and it died. But you see, David said this, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Now, what do you mean by that, preacher? I'll tell you what it means to me. It means that David understood that at one time he was, a, he, was, he, was, he was running from Saul. He was a fugitive. Saul was chasing him. And Saul tried to kill him. You know the story, how Saul turned against him. And he threw his javelin at him. And he, the Bible said Saul was demon-possessed. An evil spirit from the Lord would come upon him. And David would flee from him, and God protected David. David experienced the goodness of the Lord. He experienced the grace of the Lord. He experienced the, he experienced the patience of God. He experienced the protective hand of God. By the time David had become the king of Israel, he had come through an awful lot, folks, and God had brought him through every bit of it. And David knew he didn't deserve any of it. And so what he is saying is that there is a much higher law than us. There's a much greater righteousness than any righteousness on this earth. There is that high and holy one who truly can be offended. That high and holy one, the righteous one, the only righteous one. And I sinned against him when I did what I did. That's acknowledging his transgression. That's acknowledging it in the right way. Because if you get the relationship right with God your relationship will be right with each other. Get it right with God, and it'll be right with each other. Amen. This is why so many churches don't have any fellowship. There's no power because there's nobody right with God. So that's what the message is about tonight. How do I get right with God? How do I get right with God? In the book of Job, chapter number 2 and verse number 9, we begin to understand the real battle that rages in the spirit world. In Job chapter number 2 and verse number 9, Job's wife said this to him. Job 2 verse 9. Then said his wife, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The reason she said this is because God has cursed you. So you curse him. Now, what you're going to see here is the high, elevated spiritual battle that raged back 1,900 years before Christ and is still raging to this very day. As I've said to you so many times, the works of the flesh, the drunkenness and fornication and lying and, and lasciviousness, and all of this stuff that the flesh practices and it lusts after and wallows in, that's the flesh. You don't need a devil to do that. Amen. That's just your flesh. And in your flesh dwelleth no good thing. Amen. Nothing. It's when you begin to rise up in spiritual understanding, when you begin to rise up in your sincere relationship with God, that's when you really begin to get a sense of what sin is about. Satan said this, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. In plainer words, personal survival is the number one goal of every man on this earth, and he or she will do whatever they have to do to survive. That's what Satan said. Did you know what? He's 99% correct. Do you realize that what Satan said applies to most people you meet every day in your life? How did Satan know that? He knew it by observation. 
when the moment God made Adam, created him in the garden, brought him up out of the dust of the ground, formed a body, breathed into that body the breath of life, that body stood up as a living soul, a man in the image of God, Satan saw him. And boy, did he ever put his sight on him as an object, a rival, and an object of hatred. Amen. He went after him at that moment. At that very moment, he went after him to destroy him. There is a principle that God is going to defend that is higher than the lie of Satan. When you get into this area of spiritual truth and spiritual power, God operates on this principle. Righteousness will overcome goodness will overcome evil. When God is right, God's righteousness and his right will overcome Satan's lie and the liar. Amen. It may take thousands of years of human history to do the job, but the day will come when God is judged and God will be found just in everything that he does. Amen. He's just. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? Amen. God is just. I tonight only have a small just really a small window of understanding into what's going on between Satan and God. But I do know this. Satan is allowed access to God. Satan is allowed to accuse the brethren. Satan is allowed to bring accusations and charges against you. And then Satan and God vie for your soul. God allows Satan to have so much legal ground. Satan is the God of this world. Satan can give kingdoms to whomsoever he will. Satan is right now running the kingdom of heaven right here on this earth. The Bible says they take it by force and God lets him do it. And he's going to prove a point for when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back the second time, the scripture says in Revelation, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ. He will come back and forcibly take what belongs to him. That's what the, that's what the advent has to do. Second advent, folks, is, a, is the second advent of Christ is a many faceted thing. It's not just one event. The second advent of Christ starts with the rapture of the church of the living God when we're called out to meet him and it ends when he comes in heaven opens and behold a white horse and he that sat upon him was called faithful and true and in righteousness he that judge and make war. There's a period of seven years that, that, that covers the second advent of Christ. Amen. Because the rapture is part of it. Because we're caught up to meet him in the clouds, in the air. There's a rapture that takes place in the middle of the tribulation period. And there's a rapture that takes place at the end of the tribulation period. Three raptures. One, two, three. The rapture that takes place at the end of the tribulation period is when the saints are caught up to meet him in the clouds. He comes in the clouds and he comes with power and great glory. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah to God. The rapture that takes place in the middle of the tribulation period is, is uh, typified by Moses and Elijah or whoever the two witnesses are when the scripture says the Bible, the heavens open and the word comes down and says, come up hither and he calls them up out of this world. Amen. These are the ones that you find in Matthew chapter number 24 when it says, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. Five wise, five foolish virgins. Five had oil, five didn't have oil. That's a mid-tribulation rapture. But the rapture that takes place at the big beginning of the tribulation is for the saints of God, it's for us. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, the twinkling of an eye. This is why so many brethren get messed up and put the church right smack in the middle of the tribulation period and say that we're going to be raptured either in the middle or the end of the tribulation period because there's a rapture there. But that's not the church. We're gone at the beginning of the tribulation period. So the Lord has a battle. He has a confrontation. He has something going on with Satan. It is not as simple as cut and dried, black and white, as, as people try to make it. Well, God's doing this and the devil's doing that. And if you're sinning, the devil made you do it. That is so babyish and simplified. It has nothing to do with the revelation of the Bible. God may allow you to do this so he can prove that. He may allow this to happen so he can show the devil up for what he is here. Amen. These are elements that are going on right now in your life. Is your life coming apart or is it getting better in the Lord? Are you growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord? Amen. Curse God 
and die, she said. Curse God and die. You speak as a foolish woman, he said to his wife. In Job chapter number 1 and verse number 9, Job, Satan poses this question. Doth Job fear God for naught? That's a good question. In plainer words, oh, he fears you. Well, what is the reason for him fearing you? And why should he fear you? Satan said that you have built a hedge about him. You have walled him in. What kind of a servant is that? He doesn't have to face the same temptations. He's not vulnerable to the same problems. He lives in the same world, but he doesn't have to worry about that world. What kind of servant is that? You see what's happening? Yes, and when God removed the hedge and allowed Job to become vulnerable to Satan, Satan knew he could destroy him. But did he destroy him? No, he didn't destroy him. Would he destroy you? You might be down in the lowest point you've ever been in your life. You may think that your faith is so shipwrecked that you'll never go in a church house again or you'll never pray to God again. You'll never live for the Lord again. Everything went wrong. You might have done something for God and you might have been rejoicing in your service in the Lord and everything came against you. And right now you are completely shipwrecked. And you may be saying to yourself, how could I have ever found myself in a situation like this. Did you ever stop to think that God may let you get there so he can put you somewhere else? Did you know that when he went to get Mephibosheth, he was in Lodibar? Did you know the word Lodibar means a place of foreign, a, pa a place of rejection, a place where there's no hope, a place of desolation? That's where Mephibosheth was. He was in Lodibar. And they went down there and they called him out of Lodibar. They called him in the pit. They called him out from the lowest place he could possibly be and brought him into the castle and set him at the king's table. Amen. There's a vast difference between a shipwrecked faith and a rebel against God. You've got a lot of rebels out there that just literally refuse to serve the Lord and live for him, and they're living in rebellion. But you've got people out there that have been broken, bruised reed and smoking flax. And these people need help. And they need, they need somebody that's got spiritual discernment to know how to restore them in the spirit of meekness, considering yourself also. You notice that nobody that came around Job, not one single soul that ever came to Job could say one word to instruct him right or to help him except Elihu. And Elihu is a mysterious person in the book of Job. He just pops up all of a sudden, then he's gone. And the three friends of Job, we know all about them. And God said about those three friends of Job in the last chapter, he said, you have not spoken according to my word. You don't have a clue what you're talking about. But here's what Job said. Turn over here to Job chapter number 42 and verse number 6. In Job 42 and verse number 6, Job said this. He said, Wherefore, I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, there's a lot of argument today, a lot of controversy about whether repentance is part of the gospel of Christ. All right? You can get into your theological halls and you can open up your systematic theology and you can follow this one and you can chase that one and you can quote this and you can quote that. And let me tell you something tonight that's the most practical thing in the world. It's very practical. Very practical. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Amen. You believe he is. They say that back 2,000 years ago when the Romans would begin to question the Christians, that the one thing that they could never get them to recant or, or change their mind on was that one thing right there. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? And they would say yes, knowing that they would die because they said it. I believe he is, don't you? Do you believe he went to a cross and there on that cross? He died on that tree for you in your place. He died and he was buried. And then on the third day he arose from the dead. He arose from the dead. And now 40 days later ascended to the right hand of the Father and he's coming again, all right? You believe that. You believe that. There's nothing wrong with believing that. That's a wonderful thing to believe because it's the truth. 
Now, there are those who will say to you, now, you believe what you're supposed to believe. You're saved, you see. This is what's called easy believism. And the argument, well, they'll say, well, now, you mumble a little prayer, say a few words, say the sinner's prayer, repeat after me, whatever, whatever you want to add to it, embellish it, however you want to. It's meaningless. Here's the key to that. This is the key. And you can't get around this. It's one of those things that, that is self-evident in itself. In other words, if you have ever had an encounter with God, a real encounter with God, you will do exactly what the demons did when the Bible says they believe and they tremble. Amen. You see, Job said, I abhor myself. Why did he say that? Because he had had an encounter with God. He said, I talked about you. He said, but now I've seen you. He said, I was a teacher, an instructor, a great man of wisdom. Yet now I look back and see how foolish all of that was. Why? He had had an encounter with God. Now here's how it works. When the Holy Spirit comes into the world, he'll convince men of sin because they believe not on me. Right? John's chapter number 16. Saving faith has nothing to do with words that you mumble. Saving faith has nothing to do with a bunch of facts that you assent to. Saving faith is completely and entirely something that has to do with you and your relationship with God and about the Lord Jesus Christ. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son hath not life. I want to make it as plain as I know how tonight. You don't have to say repentance is not part of salvation like a lot of them do or repentance is part of salvation like a lot of them do. It's a simple fact. If you ever have an encounter with God, that's the day you start repenting. Amen. And you'll repent for the rest of your life. You'll repent and you'll repent and you'll repent and you'll repent. You'll repent and you'll repent. There'll be times you'll be repenting. You're not even sure what you're repenting for because you're getting, you just know you're in his presence and you are repenting and you'll be saying, have mercy on me, O God. You will be. You'll say, I love you, Lord, but God be merciful to me, a sinner. God be gracious, be gracious, and you will be repenting. There are those who argue fine points and say repentance is simply a change of the mind. Oh, is, is it? Metanao is the word, Greek word metanao. All right. And you take the Greek word and you define theology by the meaning of a Greek word. No, you don't. You make the biggest mistake you'll ever make in your life by taking a Greek word and define a scriptural doctrine by that Greek word. No, sir. You let the Bible define itself. Let it define the term of repentance. Let it define what faith is about. Let it define what, what righteousness and redemption is about. Because there are more than one Greek word that can be used to refer to something like that. No, that's a big mistake. Big, big mistake. But here's the simple fact. If you have never had a desire in your heart to cry out to God to be merciful to you and forgive you for who you are and what you've done, you have no idea what repentance is about. But I don't need to tell you that. It's self-evident. Are you following me? Now, you don't need some preacher to come along and say, Preacher, have I repented? No, no, no. You'll know if you've repented. But let me tell you something. If you have saving faith, you've repented. Right? Yes. You don't argue that point. And the fact of the matter is, when I got saved and I got right with God, I, I wasn't thinking about all the sins I'd committed. I just knew I was a sinner. I mean, I, I didn't have a list drawn up here where I, where I named them all off one by one before the Lord. He knew. But he also knew in my heart I was sorry for who I am, sorry for what I'd done. I wanted mercy and forgiveness on my soul. That's repentance. It's not just changing your mind. It has to do with a whole heart relationship and attitude toward God. So if you find some 
preacher who likes to argue fine points and argue about metanaho and get into these Greek words and all of this and say, well, now, if you really believe, if you really believe a New Testament belief, that is repentance, then you've got a hold of somebody here that never has repented themselves. It's like me trying to tell you what it's like to be born again when you've never been born again. You'll never know what it's like to be born again until you've been born again. Then once you are born again, then you understand, I don't really need to tell you what it's like to be born again. It's self-evident. Amen. Amen. How many of you folks were born again before you ever met me? Amen. Amen. That's something. Look at all these hands in here. Yeah. <laughs> then you don't need me to confirm to you what, was, uh, what had already happened to you long before you ever met me. Right. Amen. Amen. <laughs> the new birth is such a profound change in your life. That whether another soul on the whole face of the earth has ever been born again, you know you have. <laughs> you know something has happened to you that has changed your life and somebody has moved in that wasn't in there before. All right? And if that has happened, you repented. <laughs> Amen. And so Job says, I abhor myself. Now, hold on a minute. Job, you're messed up, son. You need to say, I love myself. Right? We need to straighten Job up. He's messed up here. He needs to listen to some of our modern gurus. Job, now you're doing good until you got to that. Here you're saying you abhor. Abhor means I hate myself, folks. I abhor myself. That's what Job said. Job needs a little psycho work here. He needs a little Christian psycho babble to work his mind over and get him squared away. Job's all messed up. He needs to learn to love himself. And once you learn to love yourself, you've got the key to victory, and that's it. You're going to say alone, you're the greatest thing on the face of the earth, right? Blah, blah, blah. That's your problem now. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I'd like to put the women on one side and the men on the other side and talk to the wives for a little while about the husbands and talk to the wives knowing the husbands doesn't know what the wife said or which wife talked to and find out how many of these wives would say, Preacher, let me tell you what the problem is in our marriage. My husband loves himself more than he does me. Don't, I'm not asking any wives to raise their hand tonight. <laughs> but I'll bet you right now that that is the problem in a lot of marriages. Yes, sir. Our problem today is not a lack of self-love. Oh, no. And you don't need to go around hating yourself. But what you had happen right here is a personal encounter with God. And when he saw himself for who he was and he saw God for who he was, he hated his vile, low condition. And it'll be the same way with you and the same way with me. Same thing, same thing. When I compare myself to him, I am dust and ashes. That's all I am. Vile creature that I am. And by the grace of God, he saved me. Hallelujah. No, self-love is not your problem. <laughs> not a lack of self-love. That's not the issue. Now, when you come to the book of Hebrews, I love Hebrews. It's an unusual book. Now, how many of you if, have ever read through the book of Hebrews and was struck with this? It just kind of jumped out at you. Have you ever noticed all the times that it says, let us, let us, let us, let us? Let us, let us. You remember in Sunday school this morning I was talking about the comparison between angels, the nature of an angel, and the seed of Abraham? And when Christ came into the world, the Lord said to these angels, let all the angels of God worship that little baby in the manger. We talked about that in Sunday school. Hebrews is different because the book of Hebrews is addressed to Hebrew believers in the first century that were coming out of Judaism. They were coming away from the temple. They were moving away from the sacrifices of the Mosaic law, and they were coming into the simple grace of God and salvation by grace, trusting the finished work of Christ. He even had to show them how that the priesthood of Aaron, Moses' brother, the priesthood of Aaron had now been moved aside and the priesthood of Melchizedek, a universal priesthood that transcends Israel, moves way past them to all mankind, was now the priesthood in power and authority. 
He had to show them how that the sacrifices of the Old Testament were temporal sacrifices that could not take away sin. That the time would come when these temporal sacrifices would cease to have power. They wouldn't have any meaning anymore. And that now there is an eternal sacrifice that is made one time forever when Christ entered into the presence of God for us. Then he comes to the Old Testament saints who are coming out of Judaism and he says to them, Now the day of rest, the seventh day, God gave you that seventh day as a day of rest. It's a sign between God and Israel. But now there is a rest that is much greater than that rest. This rest is no longer a day. This rest is a person. He becomes our Sabbath. And so one after another, after another, after another, the writer of Hebrews, not to put down nor diminish the Old Testament typology and saints, but to show you the comparison between the two, says, now look at what we had here and now look at Christ. He is so much better. You've heard that said before, haven't you, that the book of Hebrews talks about better things. And so many times he's showed you to be so much better. Then the book of Hebrews gets into the deepness or the depth of what it is to be a Christian and to walk with God. And you have these invitations in the book of Hebrews, how you are invited to come into the presence of the Lord. Let us, let us, let us. Isn't that a wonderful invitation? It's not like, let me show you what I'm going to do. No, he says, let us. Come go with me. You're welcome. Let's enter into the presence of God. Let us draw nigh with full assurance of faith. Let us. See, these are invitations. The book of Hebrews is full of invitations. Now, let me read some of them for you tonight. You want to get right with God? How do you get right with God? Well, if you know what repentance is, and you know what it is to understand your sin and who you sinned against, you understand what sin is, ultimately. It is a violation against God's holiness and His character. That's what sin's about. You're violating God and His holiness and His character. And you're pleading only for mercy. You're taking the steps necessary to get right with God. These things matter. They're important. Then once you are right with God, what do you do? You draw nigh to Him. You draw nigh. This is another one of those self-evident things like I was talking about. You don't have to tell somebody to repent. If they really believe and accept Christ, they've repented because there's going to be a change, all right? Well, this draw nigh to God, this is self-evident. If you truly have been cleansed and purged, you are right with God. You know what you want to do? You want to get next to him then. That's what you want to do. You want to, you want to come to him just naturally because you cry out as Paul said in Romans 8, Abba, 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 Father, Father, Father. And they tell us that that Abba is what a child would say, Abba, Abba. Abba, a child can say that, say, Father, Father, and you want to draw nigh to him. And so notice the invitation, Hebrews chapter number 4, verse 16. Let us, invitation, therefore come boldly. Now the word boldly here has nothing to do with the, with, the, with, the con, with the contemporary use of the word, which has been perverted. The word boldly here means with confidence. Let us come with confidence. Let us know that if we draw nigh to him, he won't shut us off. He won't turn us away. He'll accept us when we draw nigh. See, I've got to be perfect to draw nigh. You kidding? You haven't read 1 John yet, have you? Let us draw nigh. Notice the second one, chapter number 10, verse 22. Let us therefore come boldly, throne of grace, find mercy and grace to help in need, time of need. Hebrews 10, 22. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Now watch this. This is a beautiful thing. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now is anybody in this house tonight that Satan beats you to death with your past? When do you get older? The older I get, the more my past gets drug up to me. I don't know what it is. I can't explain it, but it sure does. You know what's happening? Satan is trying to destroy my walk with God by giving me an evil conscience. But the Bible says that my conscience has been cleansed and been purged. So I am tonight either who Christ says I am or who Satan will drag me down to be. And I have to make a decision in my mind by renewing my mind to make a choice. Am I what God says I am or am I what Satan says I am? And the battle rages in the soul. You listening? 
The intellect, the emotion, the will, the thinking processes of a man take place in his soul. Intuition, consciousness, and communion are the high points of the spirit. Intuition, consciousness, communion, the spirit. You're not even conscious sometimes of that communion and that highness of the spirit that connects with God. But you are firmly conscious of your intellect, emotion, and will because that's your soul. And most people live in the area of the soul. And if Satan can get into your soul and mess up your soulish mind and fill you full of the past and give you an evil conscience, then he's going to continue to break that fellowship with God. And that's what he wants to do. As the old timers used to say, if he can't stop you from getting saved, he'll stop you from living for God or he'll stop you from having communion and fellowship with the Lord. Because Satan knows that if he can stop that, he'll kill your life. Because the only way your life will ever survive on this earth until God takes you out of here is to have communion with God. Amen. You've got to have communion with him. You've got to commune with God. Right. And I've said a thousand times, and I'll say it again tonight, you are the only creature in the universe that can commune with God. Amen. No angel, no cherubim, no seraphim. Nowhere in the Bible does that ever say they can. If they can, the scripture doesn't say they can, but it sure does say you can. Amen. Therefore, man was made for fellowship with God. That's why God made you in his image. Amen. 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 So he says, cleanse that. And then in chapter number 12 and verse number 1, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and run with patience the race that is set before us. And the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy 4 says, I have finished my course. I've kept the faith, finished my course. In other words, we've got a course to run. And every one of us have our own life that God intends to live out through us in the Lord Jesus. I don't know what your course is. All I know is where I am right now. And I know that my calling and election is made sure. But I don't know what my complete course is. God hadn't told me where I'll be 10 years from now. I hope 10 years from now we all be in heaven. But here's what I've made my mind up to do by the grace of God. I'm going to run it. <laughs> See? You got to do so. You have to get firm about some things. You have to say, yes, Lord, I'm going to run that course. I'm going to finish my course. I'm going to do it by the grace of God. Have you considered where you came from? Would you swap what you have now for where you came from? I wouldn't. Because I know where I came from. Still fresh on my mind. So he said, we run with patience. Lay aside besetting sins and weights. And then in chapter number 12 and verse 28, he said, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. And then chapter 13, verse 13, Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp, bearing his reproach. In plain words, identify with our Lord Jesus Christ. Whatever camp it might be depends on your cultural situation where you live, but whatever it is, it makes no difference. Identify yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. I am his and he is mine. I belong to him and therefore I am a Christian and I will be a Christian till the day God takes me out of this world. I'm not an atheist. I'm not an agnostic. I'm not a Muslim. I'm not a Jew. I'm not a Hindu. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of it. I have no reason to be, uh, to be, uh, to be uh, uh, intimidated by anybody's religion or by anybody's government. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the grace of God shall be until I draw the breast, last breath in this body. And I couldn't do anything finer with my life. Amen. I'm telling you. I couldn't do anything better with my life Amen. than to give it to him. Amen. He loved me and gave himself for me. Yes, yes. least I can do is live for him. Yes, I'm a Christian. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm a believer. Amen. And regardless of what kind of mess or shape I find myself in, dogfight I get into with the devil, I always come back to one thing that Satan cannot refute. I am a Christian Amen. devil, and you know it, <laughs> and you can't change it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name, 
Bless your holy word tonight. Thank you, Father, for this little time we had together together and fellowship around your scriptures and fellowship around Christ and fellowship in the sweetness of the Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd bless it now for those that are here in this auditorium, for those that are watching this over the Internet, for those that will watch it later. Bless each one of them. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray, and for Jesus' sake we ask it. And amen. All right. What do we got, brother? Page 383 in your all American. Appreciate you praying for me. Whatever that thing was is gone. <laughs> I hope it doesn't come out there and get on you. 